understand. place here. Put your hands together now. Come on. In the 
darkness you were away without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt Church of Christ was born, then the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel to the bold shall not kneel, shall not faint. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has read. God, we praise you. We cannot praise you enough, God. We want this to be a time where we show you that we love you and we need you. We need you as king. We need you as master. And we praise you as such. May this time be yours, God. This time of remembering you and also remembering those others that we should remember. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Thank you. 
When I look back through history and consider all the sacrifices in every war, and I try to grasp it all, come to grips with it, stand in reverence of all those willing to give their lives for something bigger than themselves, I am stunned by the sheer numbers. All those lives, all those families serving their country, I can't always comprehend it. My heart is not big enough to take it all in. That each one didn't come home. What they lost for their service. What we gained for their courage. Today, I stop to remember. Every single number is one soldier. One sailor who got up in the morning and put on a uniform. One Marine who answered the call to fight for freedom. One airman who knew the cost and went anyway. One man or woman who paid the ultimate price for many. And the freedom I live in now. Today, I remember. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that we can take this time um, this weekend just to remember those who have made the ultimate sacrifice for us, Lord, so that we can have freedom in this country. You too made the ultimate sacrifice for us so that we can have freedom, and we thank you for that. We thank you for the grace that you bestow on us. We lift up our family members and our friends that we continue to pray for daily, that they would turn to you so that they can also be free. I thank you for, um, just for our community here, that we can lift each other up and help each other. The community that we have surrounding us, I thank you for how we help each other, especially during this um, hard time that we've had over the last year, and just the growth that we've made as a community too. And I thank you for all these things. Lord, we know that freedom is not free. Father, the thousands of lives that were spent on the battlefields, Father, for freedom. Lord, um, our prayer this morning is, Lord, that they are with you. Father, they are enjoying this freedom that they now have in you. Father, the greatest sacrifice of all, of course, was the death of Jesus Christ. Lord, you went to the cross to die for our freedom, Lord, from sin. Lord, we are free from sin if we accept you. Father, this day is another memory Lord, of what things have gone on in the past. Lord, it just seems to me weekly uh, we are remembering things, Lord, that not only folks have done, but that you have done. Lord, weekly we remember, Lord, how you died. Lord, we have communion. Uh, Lord, to remind us of your sacrifice and your death. Lord, we have so many different things as the 4th of July is coming soon to remember an independence, Lord. Uh, there's just so many things that we are to remember. But Lord, all that aside, Father, today, may we never forget the sacrifice that you did for us to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, to take sin away from us, to bury it, that we will have the freedom to be able to be with you for all eternity. There is just nothing like it. Lord, right now, I ask that you just bless each person here in this room. Bless the people next door, Father, those that may be tuning in. Lord, may they receive a blessing from you today. Uh, may you bless our pastor, Father, as he brings a message to us, and we've heard some awesome 
singing and music, and we thank you for that, and we are blessed for that. So, Lord, may the blessings continue. Lord, as we leave this place today, Lord, may we not forget, but may we remember and may we tell others of the awesomeness of Jesus that has been so freely given to us. For it's all done in the precious and wonderful name of Jesus, our Savior. In his name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Jim and Tracy. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Lakeside. How glad we are that you've chosen to be here this morning with us. Here in our sanctuary, those next door in our social hall, and of course, those live streaming with us. And so let me touch upon a couple of the ministries that are happening here at Lakeside. We have coming up on Tuesday evening, our, our membership class happening in the social hall next door, 630. If you're not a part of that class, you can still be a part of that if you want to. And so feel free to talk with uh, Stan about that. And then the very next night on Wednesday, we have our prayer meeting, same place, same time. And uh, if you want to be there live or if you want to Zoom, either way, you're welcome to go ahead and join the group. And, you know, last weekend we had our, our run, the 6K, the uh, global 6K for water. Very appreciative for those who participated and for those who donated. And, you know, you can still donate if you want to, a very good cause. So if you'd like to, feel free to go ahead and talk to Jeannie or talk to, to me or Stan, and we'll, we'll, we'll get that taken care of. Also, uh, the baby bottles that you have seen in our foyer, those are to collect funds for the Crisis Pregnancy Center. An incredible ministry just to help save lives and to change lives. And so we are doing what we can to be a part of that and giving toward that particular ministry. And so if you choose to do so, you may take uh, any of those bottles and then just put uh, whatever change or money in there. And we will collect those by Father's Day Sunday and then go ahead and pass those on. Now, let me also go ahead and mention softball. If you're interested in playing softball with our church softball team in the church softball league feel free to go ahead and talk to it have to be joseph uh, hernandez today because todd's not here and so talk to joseph our awesome drummer uh, if you are interested and let me go ahead and make mention of family camp family camp is coming in a couple of weeks praise god and so that will be in a couple of weeks we look forward to being up at heartland christian camp Finally, let me make mention of some birthdays coming up. And so uh, June is right around the corner. And so uh, we have uh, Carol Ferris, who has a birthday. Maria uh, Luna, or Laura, pardon, pardon me, has a uh, birthday. And then Anna, who is back in the States. Praise God. Uh, she has a birthday coming up on the 3rd. So happy birthday to those individuals. And so now let's have our missions moment time. I will have Jeannie and Ruth come on up and share what's going on in that ministry. wanted to read this first of all. This is after the resurrection. It says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go forth, go therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And this we know as the Great Commission. So as we go into a missions update, I thought I would read that. I also wanted to tell a story. It's not about global missions, but I just I saw a video of, of an actor who became a Christian, and he was sharing his story. 
he was at the height of his career. His goal had been making money and living the good life. And he got a new cleaning lady. And his wife said, you know, this new lady, she's singing all the time, um, which I don't mind, but all the songs are about Jesus. And so he said, I wonder what that's about. So uh, she asked the cleaning lady, we notice you're singing a lot, and that's good, but why are all the songs about Jesus? And the lady actually started to laugh and said, you think I'm here to clean your house. <laughs> <laughs> and she went on to tell them, you are both going to become born-again Christians and have a ministry together, which was the farthest thing from their minds at that time. <laughs> but it did happen. So I want to encourage you in our daily lives, in our work, to be a witness. Mm -hmm. um, that's our part of the Great Commission. And uh, another part of the Great Commission, of course, is the support that we can give to the people who are global. And I, you know, I don't have it figured out, but I wonder how much um, money we um, <laughs> uh, give each day as a church to the support of missions. And um, it's, it's a good amount and uh, so encouraging that we have that kind of a heart here for what God is doing in the world. Mm -hmm. So um, I just have a brief update on two people. Um, I think the first is Sarah Kane. Um, Sarah is, is in Thailand where she grew up. Her parents were missionaries there as well. And um, she's with a ministry called Remember New, if you um, recall. Uh, it's a ministry to help children not fall into human trafficking. It's a prevention ministry, and it takes children who are at risk and gives them safe homes, um, medical care, education. Um, and uh, Sarah's specific job is to mentor uh, students post high school, students who are in university or in vocational training, and they will be able to avoid the trap of human trafficking by having a way of supporting themselves. Mm -hmm. So it's a wonderful ministry. Um, specific prayer for Sarah um, right now is they have closed Thailand again um, because of COVID, and what that means is she is not, as a, as an, a foreigner, she's not allowed to go to the children's homes. Um, and that means two th a couple of things. She's very isolated. Um, her roommate room, uh, went to a, a new country recently, so she's living alone. Um, and so just pray for her not to feel alone. Um, and that uh, there is a new roommate scheduled to come this fall, so um, just pray for that to go smoothly. Um, she is able to continue the ministry with her students, you know, via the phone and, and other um, internet options. Um, but she also asks for prayer for the people that, um, the Thai people who are now running the homes without extra help and encouragement. Mm -hmm. It puts a greater burden on them as well. So her prayer is for um, the staff of the children's homes that they have there in Thailand. So the next is the Byrne family. Um, the Byrne family um, have, uh, were in Tajikistan for over 20 years. Um, they have now located to the Philadelphia area. Um, so th the two main um, things for them, the all, almost all of their ministry now takes place over the internet um, abroad. Um, so but the, the key points right now is they're in the process of purchasing a home um, in the Philadelphia area, um, and it seems like it's going through smoothly, so that that would complete well. Um, the, the, the original home that they wanted was in quite a um, dangerous area. They wanted to be there because it was a heavily, heavy Muslim area in northeastern Philadelphia. But this home is somewhat removed from that, and uh, I'm, I feel safer about it, actually. <laughs> So, um, because uh, Mike's mom um, lives with them, which is the reason they came back to the United States was to help take care of Mike's mom. 
um, right now they are in England because um, Doreen's mom is on hospice. So um, one prayer request is for the house to go through. The other prayer request is for um, Drina's family during this time. So uh, um, they are able to continue their work while they're in England, um, but uh, t just a hard time for them all. So thank you. And then we also want to update you on the Tamayos. Um, we received a letter about a week and a half ago that phase one is complete, and so they're busy getting their paperwork for it. Um, and so now they're currently in phase two. The time for phase two, what they really had wanted to happen, uh, has not yet happened. They wanted those all to have X's. Um, in order to, to do what they feel like God's leading them to do now to start this business for the uh, escape business, they need to increase their monthly support 60%. And um, they really feel like God's calling them to it. So they're not worried about it. But we would like our congregation to maybe step in and provide even more monthly support than what we currently do. And so we're asking you guys if you could we don't want to take away from your regular tithe. That's not the idea of this. That's not what they would want. It's more, if you feel like you could give $25 more a month, $50 more a month, $100 more a month, or pray regularly and let other people know who maybe have that money to give, that you would let them know about this opportunity. Um, we really want to be able to support them more. We, as, as Ruth said, we are so blessed as a small congregation to be able to support so many missionaries. And yet each missionary has greater and greater needs all the time. And so we'd like to be able to just give them a little bit more. So what they're doing right now, even though they haven't gotten that yet, they're working on the paperwork from phase one they're working on trying to have meetings with people who, um, remotely, who would be able to support them. Some of that's difficult because of the big time difference between uh, Taiwan and here. Um, some of it's difficult because of schedules. Um, but just, they, they said that they have, um, even though they don't currently have the budget to sustain day to day in Taipei, they have the peace to move forward. And um, their go to verse has been Isaiah 42, verse 16 I will lead the blind by ways they have not known, along unfamiliar paths, I will guide them. I will turn the darkness into light before them and make the rough places smooth. These are the things I will do. I will not forsake them. And uh, another prayer request that they have also is um, COVID's hitting uh, Taiwan now, and so everything is slowing down. They were hoping, they have a realtor, they were hoping to be looking for uh, an apartment in Taipei, and right now they're not able to do that. Um, the, the church that they work with, they're not able to meet together, but they're meeting online. So just, yeah, COVID's hitting there as well. So prayers that, that um, the lockdown that they're anticipating would not happen and that they would continue to be able to move forward in their ministry as well. And again, if you do desire to give to, specifically to them, um, like what I do when I'm giving to missions is I'll add it to my regular tithe, and then in the memo, I put the amount that's for missions. So you can just add it and, and put it in, mission, in the memo what part you want to go to them or to the Burns family or any of the particular ones. Okay, thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. 
So, so Ruth, I, I appreciate what you shared because um, <clears throat> about that actor. I was actually at a conference years ago, um, and this actor was being interviewed by Rick Warren, and he shared that very same thing. It was really cool. I was like, wow, that's awesome. I just recently found out there's another actor. I can't remember his name, but if you saw his face, you're like, oh, yeah, I, I know who that dude is. He also is a Christian, and um, usually he plays a villain on a TV show or whatever, but uh, for the past three years, he hasn't gotten any work because he's a Christian, and he will not allow himself to do certain scenes because he does not want to dishonor his Lord and his wife. And so, um, but if you, if I, I wish I had a name. That way you can look for him. Uh, but anyway, he's a pretty cool dude. Memorial Day, I was, you know, looking at that video and seeing all those numbers of men and women who lost their lives in war. That's crazy, isn't it? And it makes us realize how fortunate we are that we live in a country that people who would risk their lives for, and again, all the families that were affected by that. And it's all because of sin, isn't it? All because of sin. Anyway, I'm excited to <clears throat> give this message this morning. Although I'll, I will tell you, for whatever reason, this past week, I felt like Jacob battling the angel of the Lord with this message. I even started on Monday, and I just finished it like two hours ago. The whole week, man, it just was banging my head. <clears throat> and I'm like, Lord, why is this message so hard to come together? Well, maybe there's a reason for that this morning, and I'm hoping that you will see it. So anyway... We have been looking at this long anthem of praise from Paul, from verses 3 to 14. We're going to focus on verses 11 through 14. And again, remember, Paul's in prison when he's writing this letter. When he's writing these things, he's in prison. Now, if I'm in prison, I'm not probably thinking like Paul. I'm pretty bummed out, like, get me out of here, or whatever. But um, he's so locked into the Lord that to be able to come up with the things that we've been focusing on is a mind blower. So let's continue to look at this mind blower in regards to Ephesians 1, verses 11 through 14. Paul says, in him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with his purpose, with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with the seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Let's pray. Father in, in, in heaven, um, these words are so powerful, and um, we are so grateful for this church, that we can come here, Lord, and we can, we can praise your holy name. We can learn, O oh Lord, from your precious word. And we thank you, Jesus, for um, all those who have served our country and continue to serve and Lord, we pray for our missionaries too as well, Lord. I was sitting there thinking about, you know, missionaries deal, Lord, with a thing called sensationalism. And what I mean by that, Lord, is you well know that sometimes we, we put missionaries high up there in the spiritual realm thinking, wow, look what they're doing. But you know what? It's hard. So often, Lord, there's a sense of loneliness. 
You know, we think that they're just having the time of their life spiritually, and, but man, it's not that way. It's hard work. And so we pray for our missionaries, Father God, that the most important thing for them is that they feel, Lord, your presence, that they don't feel alone, that you're with them, that even though they may be alone by other people's standards, but they are never alone because you are there with them. So, Lord, we thank you for that, and we just ask now that you'll bless this word in the name of Jesus. Amen. I have a weird favor to ask, not maybe a favor, but a kind of a, a, a thing that's already driving me nuts. Could we turn that fan off back there off? <laughs> I say that because some, when I come in here and pray sometimes, I'll turn the fans on. I have to turn that one off because it it's clicks. And if I can hear here, you're probably, your skin's crawling over there. Thank you for that. So God is to be praised for his sharing work. Now basically, I've already shared this, that we, after Easter, we've been looking at Paul's, this long anthem of praise in the beginning of Ephesians. And we spent three messages in just verses 3 and 6 alone. We talked first about God's sovereign work, that he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. And um, that's a mind blower because spiritual blessings are far greater than any earthly or, or, or worldly uh, riches that um, the world seems to chase after. And God is to be praised for his choices. We looked how God chose us before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. Then we looked how God is to be praised for his consequences. In other words, that the consequences, and when you hear the word consequences, you automatically think of negative stuff, but there are good consequences like being changed through the Holy Spirit. You're no longer who you used to be. God is constantly changing you or that you've been adopted into his family and that you are accepted. Those are the consequences that we see in verses 3 and 6. And in verse 7 through 10, we focused on God's saving work last week, redemption, the results of redemption, the reasons of redemption. And today, God is to be praised for his sharing work. Now, Paul is turning our attention to the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Now, I'm going to give you a Holy Spirit illustration here that may sound kind of weird. But here it goes. Here's a, here is a, uh, 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 maybe a riddle or a rhyme or whatever you want to call it that you probably heard before. I hope I can read it. How much wood does a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? He would chuck, he, he would <laughs> chuck you wood as much as he, as, doggone it. Yes, I'm going to start over. How much wood does a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? He would chuck you wood as much as he could and chuck as much wood as a woodchuck would if a woodchuck could chuck wood. <laughs> Woo! Yeah. Now, didn't that... Didn't that yeah. <laughs> now, didn't that change your life just now? It's called a tongue twister, as Tracy had said, designed to display the use of the same word over and over and over again. Now, I don't have this on the screen, but here's a scripture that could be a tongue twister. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 4 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. 
2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 4. It sounds like a tongue twister as well, but the same thought over and over again. Comfort, comfort, comfort. And to comfort is to bring someone alongside. It describes the Holy Spirit whose sole purpose is to help us. Help us. Well, that gets us into our outline this morning. We're going to look at number one, the place of God's sharing work. See, God's gifts, blessings, and salvation isn't found just anywhere. Paul reveals the location of all the wonders of God, and here's where they're found. They're found first in a person. They are found in a person. See, God shares his blessings with a select group of people. Verse 11 begins with the words, in him, referring to in the Lord Jesus Christ. God's blessings are found in a relationship with Jesus. Now, everyone in the world, whether saved or lost, enjoys some of God's blessings, like air. Everyone gets to experience air or water or food or life or the world and so on. All these things are given to all men. And Jesus reminds us of that in Matthew 5, 45, that says, he causes his son to to rise on the evil and the good. And he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Both those common blessings end, though, at the door of salvation. You see, God's children get the best of his blessings. They get everything that belongs to the Father. Now, that's a mind-blowing comment right there. Because what I understand this, what I believe, when we die and go to heaven, when we've lived in this world, trusting in Jesus through it all, and then when we die and we go to heaven, the very things that God has belongs to us. There is no way, see, see, that's trying to comprehend that God's never been created. That hurts your head if you try to think through that. That's the same thing. Because we think, well, you know, I'm going to get to heaven, and God's going to be up there. He's always going to be God, and that's cool, and, 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 and we're going to worship him. We don't know what that looks like. But God says, what belongs to me will belong to you. That's a mind blower. Romans 8, 17 says this. Now we are his children. Then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. The things that belong to God will belong to me. doesn't mean I'm going to be God. God's always going to be God. Heaven is going to be constantly worshiping the Lord and never get old. But the things that belong to him will belong to me because I am an heir, a co-heir with Christ. That should get us really excited about what we have in store. There's a story about a um, this dad. He was a uh, he was an art collector. He collected some of the most expensive and exquisite paintings there were. Well, his son 
um, was in the military and in war. And um, his son got wounded, and there was another soldier who grabbed him and was trying to pull him to safety, and his, the son didn't make it. Well, there was another guy who, who kind of watched it all happen, and this guy was relatively good at drawing. So he drew that scene of another soldier taking his son, and he just drew a picture. And so, um, you know, the father got news, sorry, your, 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 your son's passed away. But the soldier comes and he goes, hey, you know, um, I drew this picture of your son being helped. Um, I want to give it to you. This father was so appreciative and so excited that top of his a wall on top of his uh, over his fireplace was this expensive awesome painting he takes it down and he puts that picture that this soldier painted well years go by and um, this father passes away and um, there's no one there's no heir so his house and all his artwork, everything, goes into an estate. But he drew up with his lawyers and his will that, um, you know, when you do the estate, the first thing that's got to go is the son, my son's painting. It's the first thing that's got to go. So they do an auction, right? They're auctioning off and... First thing on the auction is this picture. It's not the greatest picture, but it's... Can I get $100 to start off the bidding? No one's doing anything. Finally, someone says, 10 bucks sold. Auction's over. What? Auction's over? This guy's got all kinds of amazing art. We talk about auctions over. He says, yeah, well, this, the owner said that whoever gets his son gets everything else. You see, when you get the son, Jesus Christ, in your heart, you get everything else. That's why we're a church. That's why we talk to people about Jesus. That's why there are people who are on drugs or people who are caught in prostitution. They're human trafficking and then the whole nine yards, they can be set free and get everything through Jesus. So, they're found in a person. They are also found in a plan. Paul said that we can, we've been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. See, the word predestined is a hard concept for people to understand. But just because election and predestination is a hard teaching doesn't change the fact that it is true. That it is biblical doctrine. Now, when I, when I say doctrine, all I'm saying is a teaching. I'm talking about a teaching. In fact, verse 11 makes a clear statement about the sovereignty of God. It says, God works out everything for the purpose of his will. And it, this either means then that God controls all things, even salvation, or it means nothing. Either it is true or it is a lie. And I would like to think that God knows what he's talking about. Amen? Amen. Paul says in Romans 3, verse 4, Let God be true and every man a liar. And so predestination simply means appointed or, or destined. See, God's made a plan for his people sometime in the past. And the difference between election 
and predestination is that with election, God determines who will be saved. Predestination determines those saved will experience certain things. See, election has to do with salvation. Predestination has to do with sanctification. And sanctification is another word for constantly becoming more holy through your your Christian experience of life. And election is about God's choice. Predestination is about God's changes. And election has to do with eternity. Predestination has to do with time. So God's work in every child's life so that they will experience a changed life here and an eternal life later. In Psalm 37, 23, it says, The Lord makes firm the steps of the one who delights in him. Though he may stumble, he will not fall, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. I am so grateful that the Lord determines my steps. Because in the complication of life, I need to know that someone's holding my hand and leading me the right way. See, God has an ultimate plan for each of his children. In the meantime, he orders life's events to make us more like Jesus. We forget that, don't we? Things happen to us, we're like, oh man, why God let this happen? And we get all discouraged, and we start thinking negatively, and man, I'm going to stop going to church, or, or why do I even read the Bible? God doesn't care about me. And you're like, wake up. He's trying to make you like Jesus right now. In this situation. That's why he saved us. So that we can become more like Jesus. That's the ultimate goal. That's what Adam and Eve had before they sinned. They were like Jesus. They were perfect. And God's like, I'm giving you an opportunity to experience what they had. And for all eternity. That's the goal. To be more like Jesus. Not to make more money. Not to get a best job or a nice house or a nice car or whatever. Those are just byproducts of the blessing to the Lord. It's to be more like Jesus. That's why he saved us. And when we leave this world, God has predestined us to live with him for eternity in his home in heaven. And that is what biblical predestination is all about. God has a plan, and he's working that plan every single second of time. And being a part of God's eternal plan is the only way to enjoy the best of his blessings. Well, then we see that they are found in his pleasure. See, verse 11 again says that his children are chosen, predestined according to his plan and purpose of his will. But verse 12 says, for the praise of his glory. So the blessings we enjoy, whether heavenly or earthly, come through the heart of God who takes great joy in blessing his people. And God is so good because he simply wants to be. It brings him pleasure. When you are experiencing just the peace and love and and, and, and the, the heavenly riches of life, it brings God pleasure. Have you ever done something good for someone and got completely blown off? You ever done that? Or have that happened to you? Sometimes it's the most simplest thing, like 
you'll open a door for somebody and they just like, eh. Don't say anything. They don't have to, but man, give me a nod or something. Give me a wink, wink your eye or raise your eyebrow or something. Don't blow me off. Another thing that I cannot understand, and I'll say this, you can go on a hike and be 10 miles and see nobody. And here comes the person walking. They won't even look you in the eye. What? What's up with that? They blow you off as if you, weren't even, you don't even exist. But you know what, though? That's what we do to God way too often. And with that, how in the world can God be so good to us? And the crazy thing that God found pleasure, get this, God found pleasure in sending his own son to die for our sins. Isaiah 53.10 says, yes, it's not on the screen, but yes, it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. I remember Francis Chan was trying to explain this Garden of Gethsemane thing where Jesus is crying out to his father, like, Lord, if there's any other way, please let this cup pass from me. And here the father is looking at his son, and Francis is talking about, there's no way I can do that to my son. But God actually says that Jesus, when he asked him that question, Jesus says, please take this cup from me. His father said, I must crush you. I must crush you because I love all of them. You know, again, this reminds me, and this is interesting when I'm preparing these messages, that something comes to me and I, I'm going to run with it, but back in 2000, there was this uh, movement for uh, college-age kids called Passion, not not the passion like the movie, but it was called Passion. And it was somewhere in Tennessee, and they took this, this kind of mountain or these hills, and they brought in this, this uh, concert of Christian musicians, um, great speakers, and thousands upon thousands of college kids would come. It was kind of like Christian Woodstock. And there was this one uh, preacher who was just preaching such a powerful message that he had towards the end of his message that he would have this big old cross that would start way up on top and slowly come down with these college kids just carrying this cross. And as they get closer and they're going to mount this cross, you literally have college kids running and diving at the bottom of the cross. Because they were understanding what Jesus had to do, that his father had to crush him for them. And at that moment, they were not taking this for granted at all. I still love that image of the running and diving to bow the cross of Jesus Christ. Now, the second thing here is the purpose of God's sharing work. And Paul reveals two purposes of this. The first is to reveal his glory through us. Verse 12 says again, We who were the first to hope in Christ might be the praise for his glory. In other words, God saved us to reveal his glory through through. Or, excuse me, God saved us to reveal his glory through us to a lost world. See, so when the world sees a saint of God, they should be seeing a living, breathing testament to God's saving power. You see, that's one of the reasons why God saved Israel or called Israel to be a special people unto him 
so that God would find glory through them and the rest of the world would say, wow. Remember all those nations were like, we are so scared of this nation. Because their God does not mess around. Well, guess what? God is getting glory through them. And as individuals, as saints, God wants to use us to tell this lost world how awesome he is. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And this refers to an artist's masterwork, the crown and creation of all his ability and talent. And God's children represent the pinnacle of his power. And we are a living testimony of his glory of God's saving power through Jesus Christ. There are places in the world that you stand in awe and you look like, oh my goodness, look at that. That is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. And God looks at that and says, yeah, that's pretty cool, but you're better than that. You're, you're, you are the pinnacle of my glory. Philippians 1.27 says, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Because whether we understand it or not, the world is watching. And that is why Paul describes our lives as a book being read by the lost. And what I mean by that is 2 Corinthians 3.2. Your very lives are a letter that anyone can read by just looking at you. Christ himself wrote it, not with ink, but with God's living spirit. See, when the world reads our lives, what do they learn? What are they learning out of our letters of life? Do they, do they learn that Jesus changes every life he touches? Or do they learn that he makes no difference in the lives of men? And when they read us as Christians, they should see people who are different. They should see people who are spirit-filled and who live every minute under the direction of Almighty God. They should see people who talk and walk and act different than they are. And what do they see when they read your book? God saved you for his glory. So the question for us is, are you bringing God glory today? The second thing that we see in regards to the purpose of God's sharing work is to reveal his gifts to us. Paul says in verse 14 that we have, been, we have obtained an inheritance. And the word inheritance refers to something assigned to another or, or a heritage. And everyone has a heritage. Whether good or bad, godly or evil, we all have a heritage. And some of you come from a godly heritage. And praise God for that. But some have a heritage they would rather forget, and I totally understand that. But regardless of the kind of heritage that we have behind us, every saint of God is promised an awesome inheritance. Do you realize that as a Christian, you have an inheritance waiting for you. What if, sometimes I, I play this little fun game when I'm traveling. Just driving down the road, I could be in the middle of Nevada or whatever. And I'll see maybe a house or a ranch and I'll, I'll play the game like, oh yeah, so-and-so I never met, that's mine. They gave it to me. So I'm trying to envision, what's, what's it going to look like, feel like, to own that? That's my inheritance. All of us, as Christians, have an inheritance that's going to blow you away. What 
What are some of the characteristics of what we have now as Christians? We have love, peace, grace, wisdom, eternal life, joy, victory, strength, guidance, power, mercy, forgiveness, righteousness, truth, fellowship with God, and so many more. Peter says there's more to come. And he says this in 1 Peter 1, 3, and 4. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and an inheritance that can never perish or fade, kept in heaven for you. And if we can just live our lives from this moment on, realizing that we have far greater things waiting us in the future, it would help us deal with stuff right now. See, not only is there a place and a purpose, but there's also a promise. And that's the last part of our message, our last main point. The promise of God's sharing work. You see, the Holy Spirit brings us to Jesus to be saved. And the Holy Spirit keeps us engaged in our relationship with Jesus. And you see the promised Holy Spirit being played out in people's lives. And you do that, don't you? When someone is saved and they're engaged in the Holy Spirit, you just know. The story that Ruth shared earlier. The maid or, or, or whatever you want to call her, she's praising Jesus all the time. She's saved. She has the Holy Spirit living inside her. And guess what? This actor and his wife notice. So the first thing we see in the promise is that it is seen in his saving work. Paul talks about the way God saves sinners. Verse 13 says, You were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth. And you know, I make no apologies for what I believe election and predestined to teach, but I also believe that man is responsible to believe in Jesus. Paul tells us that we must trust in Jesus after hearing the word of truth. That when the gospel is preached, the Holy Spirit opens the eyes of the lost sinner and draws him to Jesus. This is what I like when Billy Graham Crusades used to take place, that he would preach an awesome salvation me message that you can't help but listen to every word he's saying, and then when he offers the gift of salvation, the people just start coming. The Holy Spirit has convicted their hearts, and they say, I need Jesus, and they come. It's seen in his saving work, and it's also seen in his sealing work. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. See, when Paul says that we are sealed, he's using a reference during his time. And if you've seen old-fashioned letters, or important documents were sealed with hot wax. The sealed document carried the authority of the person who owned the seal. And God uses a spiritual seal in regards to his children. And the seal of God's spirit represents four great truths. First is security. We are secure in our relationship to God because of his seal. And it's authentic. It belongs only to God. And it's 
has authority and it has ownership. When you're a Christian, you have an invisible spiritual mark on you that can never go away. And then it is seen by his securing work. Because verse 14 also says the Holy Spirit is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. So we all pretty much understand the meaning of the word deposit. It's like a down payment on a car or a house. And it's a promise that you are good for the rest of the money. And you pay back little by little until the car or the house is paid off. But when Jesus died for your sins, he paid for our redemption already completely. There's nothing else you have to do. You don't have to make any payments towards it. When we were saved, the Holy Spirit came into our hearts confirming that we are purchased, paid in full, and Jesus bought us and he sent his spirit to live within us to mark us as his property until the day comes when he will take us home. And the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives is proof that we are headed to heaven. And here's another just really quick reference that I think maybe sends the message home or helps you understand a little bit more Guarantee is the same word to speak of an engagement ring. When a man gives a woman an engagement ring, he is making a pledge to that woman. He is promising to be faithful, to love and to take her to himself one day. And that is what the Spirit of the Lord promises us when he saves us. He promises to be faithful, to love us, and to take us to heaven with Jesus. Well, let me conclude then with this. God has blessed us in Jesus and has opened the vaults of heaven. He has given us greater riches in Jesus than we can ever possibly imagine. And if we really understood this, we would leave this place and we would talk nothing about Jesus and heaven and spiritual things for the rest of your life. Now, in every church setting, there are three different types of people. Those who understand some of what they possess in Jesus. Those who are beginning to understand what they have. And those who still have not trusted Jesus for salvation and if that is you, you need to come to Jesus. Because as right now, this earth has been your heaven. That's all you've got. That's the best it's going to be. This world, with all this dysfunction, with wars of people who've lost their lives, if you're not a Christian, this is your heaven. This is how far it goes for you. But if you're a Christian, you're like, hey, whatever I got to deal with, disappointment, family issues, health issues, whatever it is, it is worth it. Because I have an inheritance waiting for me that's going to blow my socks off. So let us praise God for his grace and the gifts he has given us in Jesus. Because he's such a wonderful Lord and he is worthy of our gratitude. Let's pray. Amen. Oh, Lord God, your faithfulness blows me away time and time again. Once again, Lord, I found myself saying things that I wasn't planning on it, but it's you, Holy Spirit, that lives in me. And the crazy thing, at one time, 
I rejected you. I didn't want you. But because you crushed your son for me, you pursued me. You chased me down. And you put me in a position where I was like, Stan, stop running. Let me live in you. Let me change your life. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Come on now, friends. How can we not be fired up about that? So we must respond, and we must respond joyously with the wonderful understanding that our lives are meant to be lived for the glory of God. Would you stand, friends? Before the world was made, before you spoke it to be, you were the king of kings. Yeah, you were, yeah, you were, and now you're reigning still, enthroned above all things. Angels and saints cry out, we join them as we sing, glory to God, glory to God. Glory to God forever. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God forever. That's right. Creator God, you gave I could praise your great and matchless name all my days, all my days. So let my life be a blazing offering, life that shouts and sings the greatness of the King. Glory to God, glory to God. Take my life, take my life and let it be all for you and for your glory. Take my life and let it be yours. Take my life and let it be all for you and for your glory. Take my life and let it be all right. So we sing glory now. We sing glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God oh, forever. That's right. Sing again now. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God forever. Yes, we sing. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God forever. Glory to God. Excited to sing again now. Take my life, Lord. Take my life and let it be all for you and for your glory. Take my life and let it be yours. Be yours. Take my life and let it be all for you and for your glory. Take my life and let it be yours. Glory now. Sing glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God forever. Come on, let me hear you, Lakeside. Thank you, everyone, for coming. You know, there's something about Memorial Weekends or maybe Labor Day Weekends or whatever that they're just gives you an opportunity just to kind of chill and just enjoy the freedoms that we have in this country. And so... I just pray, you know, all of us, we carry stuff on our shoulders, right? The burdens of life, family, and whatever else, finances, you name it. What a blessing it is to come to church and just be able to lay it 
at the feet of Jesus and then we'll walk away feeling light, knowing that we just heard his word and it's powerful and we have so much hope. Take that with you and God bless you and have a great weekend. Amen. Amen.